Welcome everyone to today's webinar and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. My name is Barbara and I'm on the marketing team here at Azuga. I'll be helping to facilitate today's session. I'm joined today by Jeremy Collins, our VP of Marketing, and our special guest, Matt Camden from the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Uh, Matt is a senior research associate at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute and has 12 years of experience in the design and evaluation of transportation safety programs. The topic for today's webinar is focused on reducing unsafe driving by improving driver safety with a playbook. We'll also provide some tips and suggestions on how to develop a driver safety program that works for your fleet. Following today's session, we'll send you a recording of the webinar along with a digital copy of our driver safety playbook. Before we get started, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping items. Everyone should see a Q&A dialog box in the right-hand side of your screen. If you have questions during the session, please go ahead and submit them. We'll try to answer them along the way and also save time at the end with a Q&A. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt to kick us off. Hey, Matt, I don't know that we can hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks a lot, Barbara and, and Jeremy. It's a pleasure being here today. Um, I know everyone is is very busy uh, right now managing your, your fleet during this uncertain time. So I definitely appreciate you joining and, and hope you can learn some, some valuable information to help keep uh, driving safety at uh, the top of your list, um, even during these trying times we're going through right now. Um, so in the webinar today, we're going to cover a couple items. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the importance of maintaining safe driving, even when there's other things going on that are uh, equally as important. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what behaviors impact safe driving, what are the risks of those behaviors, uh, and the facts of unsafe driving. And then we're going to end with a pretty good discussion on a driver safety playbook. Um, so give you tips on, on how you can move through and, and be successful in terms of keeping your driving uh, safety record uh, at an acceptable level um, right now. And then we'll end up with a, a Q&A discussion. All right, so, so we know that, that COVID-19 has disrupted everything in our normal lives. I mean, we're inundated with, with news every day, multiple times a day. Um, I'm sure it's, it's impacted your fleet and your personal life uh, on so many levels. But even though it's impacted everything, essential operations still have to continue. And I know that many of your fleets fall into that category of being an essential operation and still needing to operate. And this places a, a huge strain on, on everyone in your organization, whether that's uh, your, your, um, your office staff, your management, and your frontline employees. And, and it could mean longer hours. It could mean increased pressure um, to meet deadlines. It could be anxiety over uh, the uncertainty. Is your family and, and friends, are they healthy? Have you been exposed to the virus? And the stress that comes along with, with all of those things. So even though we, we have all these, these extra pressures, um, more time, more commitment, anxiety, stress, there is a tendency to let our other priorities slip. And we don't want driving safety to be one of the things that falls off. We have to keep driver health and safety uh, our top concern um, when all of this is going on. Uh, so, of course, you know, we get a lot of resources on, on sanitation or, or health uh, recommendations from the CDC and from uh, states and from top management. But we can't lose focus on what you guys normally do, your, your normal driving safety. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and it really all comes down to remembering the behaviors that, that lead to crashes. So, we know that for every 
one serious crash, whether that's a fatal crash that, that costs your fleet, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, um, or the serious injury crash. For each one of those crashes that gets a lot of publicity and a lot of notice in your fleet, there are all these other crashes and incidences before that that could be used as a predictor of that larger crash. So we know that for every for every minor crash, uh, you know, there there's hundreds of near crashes, and for every near crash, there's thousands of at-risk behaviors. So we need to focus on those at-risk behaviors, try to be proactive to stop them, so that we can then limit and reduce the number of near crashes. Further, we could limit and reduce the number of minor, serious, and fatal crashes. So we know that over, uh, really, since the 70s, that driver behavior is, is the key to driving safety. We know behavior causes 92 to 94% of all crashes. So when you are in your fleet, in your fleet operations, looking at, at your risk, it's important to think about the behaviors that your drivers are doing when they're behind the wheel. Uh, there, there's really kind of four main er errors that drivers do. Um, and you can see here recognition errors, cause 41% of the crashes. And these are things such as driver inattention, uh, being distracted, or poor visual scanning techniques. Uh, there are also decision errors. These cause approximately 33% of crashes. So these are things like speeding, um, being aggressive while driving, following too close, or making false assumptions of what other road users are doing on the road. Um, performance. Errors, a lot of people think performance errors are a major cause of crash. Well, really what the research has shown over decades is that performance factors only contribute to a small percentage of crashes, uh, really about 11% of crashes. And these are things such as, you know, having poor control of your vehicle or overcompensating in an emergency situation or not reacting in time. And then finally, non-performance errors. Uh, they cause about 7% of crashes, and these things are, um, you know, being asleep while you're driving or having a medical emergency. What you're not seeing up here uh, are crashes caused by weather or vehicle malfunctions, things like that. And, and what we know is that they, even though they do happen and it is a risk, um, it happens much less frequently in terms of causing crashes. So when you are thinking about reducing your risk, uh, reducing your, your costs associated with crashes. It's important to think about the driver behaviors and design policies, procedures, um, and, and techniques that address those specific driver behaviors. Hey, Matt, I have a question yeah. on that. Um, so are, are there any ongoing kind of key performance indicators that fleet managers should be measuring um, you know, when it comes to actually influencing or tracking these driver behaviors? Yeah, it's a great question. So what we know is that there's really uh, two main types of KPIs. Uh, there are the KPIs that focus on the outcomes, and these are what fleets are really good at tracking. These are like the number of, number of crashes per maybe per million miles or per 100 miles. Um, and, and these are really useful because they help give you a high-level overarching view of how successful your safety program is. But the better KPIs to help you um, identify specific drivers that may be risky, um, to help you gauge uh, engagement in your safety program, are really focusing on the driver behavior. So uh, for an example, if you have a telematics device, uh, you could focus on how many speeding infractions a driver has, or maybe how many hard braking events a driver has. Um, you could even get into how many times a driver provides uh, feedback on, on near crashes. Um, all these things are much better at uh, giving you a good idea of how a driver is performing because all of those behaviors that I just mentioned are things that the driver can control. If you are only looking at overall crashes, there are many factors that that driver may not control. If they get into a crash that's caused by an, another vehicle driver, um, they may feel penalized um, if you're only looking at that crashes. So it's much better to, to look at the things the driver can control when developing uh, KPIs. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Okay, so, so one thing that we do uh, really good at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute are conducting naturalistic driving uh, studies. Basically, a naturalistic driving study is when we place uh, a lot of video cameras, sensors, and computers in an individual's normal everyday vehicle, whether that is their personal vehicle or the vehicle that they drive as part of their occupation. And it allows us to collect very detailed information about how people normally drive when there's not an experimenter or another individual in that car watching them. Um, typically, we do these studies over long periods of time, either months or even years, so that the driver can uh, very quickly goes back to their normal driving as if that video camera is not. Um, the good thing about this, it shows us what are the common behaviors people do, and it also allows us to assess the risk of those specific behaviors. So in, in this table here, we have just uh, some common behaviors we see, general aggressive driving, intentional signal violations, uh, speeding, following too close, things like that. And the middle column on this table is an odds ratio. This is a simple analysis where any number above one is in showing an increase in crash risk, and any number below one is showing a decrease in crash risk. So in all of these behaviors here, you see that they are increasing the crash risk. So for example, general aggressive driving, people who or when an individual drives aggressively, they are 34 times more likely to be involved in a crash compared to a driver that is not driving aggressively. Uh, the last column over here is how often we saw those behaviors. So for example, even though driving aggressively seriously increases your crash risk by, by 34 times, we didn't see it very often. It only happened in 0.1% of all of the driving videos over hundreds of thousands, even millions of trips. We only saw it about 0.1% of the time. So not very often. Um, the, the number of behaviors we, or I guess the most common behaviors we saw in terms of General driving was speeding. Of course, it happened uh, almost 3% of the time. And this isn't just speeding one or two or even five miles above the speed limit. This is uh, kind of serious speeding um, 10 or more miles above the speed limit. And when somebody is speeding 10 or more miles above the speed limit, they are almost 13 times more likely to be involved in a crash. And then the other common uh, behavior we saw was intentional stop sign violation. So this could be a rolling stop. Um, it increased crash risk by a, a little over five times. So because we co collect naturalistic video, we have video examples of what all these things look at. So even though in your fleet, you may um, think you know what your drivers are doing behind the wheel, these are actually what we know drivers are doing with these videos. So all of these drivers uh, knew they had a video in their vehicle. They were all driving a, a fleet vehicle. So in this first example we're going to show is an example of a driver driving too fast. You can see it's nighttime. Uh, th this driver is uh, going through a curvy section of this road. He's fairly attentive, as you can see in his face in the top left corner. The top right, you see looking out the front windshield. He's approaching this corner right here. He was going way too fast and actually had to slam on his brakes to avoid running off the road. So that's just an, one example of, of speeding. You could see if he hadn't slammed on his brakes at that last second, he would have run off the road, um, maybe tipping over his vehicle, maybe hitting a, a sign, either way, causing a crash that, that's gonna cause the fleet to uh, incur some damage. Uh, here's another common example we see. This is uh, following two quotes. So in this video, you can see the top two quadrants, driver's face looking out the front windshield. The bottom two are looking back as if we're looking in the side mirrors. If you look in that top right quadrant, you'll notice he's following that vehicle uh, pretty closely. Um, the vehicle in front of him slows down to change lanes. The vehicle goes very slowly over. This driver, instead of slowing down himself, 
just continued on, swerved out of the lane. He's very lucky there was no car in that right passenger side lane. He definitely would have hit it. Um, much safer thing he should have done was slow down, stay back, allow that vehicle to, to completely change lanes to the left uh, instead of trying to swerve around him. All right, and then the, the last video we have is um, this driver, and I'll play it in a second. This driver is tired. Uh, if you watch his eyes over on the right side, you can see he actually completely falls asleep. Uh, the main reason I want to show this video is, is about wearing a seatbelt, and this is something else you can track with your telematics device. Um, wearing a seatbelt is the number one best method that you can get your drivers to help them stay safe while they're driving. Even if they do get into a crash, if they're wearing their seatbelt, they're most likely going to come away uninjured. However, as you'll see in this video, um, if you're not wearing a seatbelt, uh, you can you'll see what what happens. So you see his eyes close, close again, completely asleep, uh, hits the guardrail can't get control of his vehicle, crosses the median, flips his car over. But just look to see what happens. Uh, he ends up in the back seat sideways. If this individual had been wearing a seatbelt, you notice his, his, his driver's seat was untouched. He would have stayed in his seat um, and incurred way less injuries than he did uh, without the seatbelt. Hey, Matt, I feel like that's really powerful to like see these videos and everything and I think everyone on this call can agree like the reason why we're doing this webinar and people are, are on it is because they want to protect the drivers uh, yeah. but one thing we hear a lot at Azuga and, and I think all of our customers kind of go through this as well is the, the driver's objections themselves you know and like their resistance to having this camera in their cab uh, and having that kind of big brother feel. So even though that's not the intention, there's always that element of, of drivers feeling like somebody's watching them. Uh, do you have any tips on like, like how do you overcome that objection and kind of resistance to the monitoring of their driving behaviors? Sure, yeah, we, we do a lot of research with onboard monitoring systems beyond just our naturalistic data. And it's, it's the number one question we get from, from drivers and from fleet managers. Uh, our best suggestion from, from doing research, looking at best practices related to the implementation of, of video monitoring systems is it all comes down to communication. Um, we need to be upfront talking to the drivers early before you implement the technology. And it comes down to making sure the drivers understand the reasoning uh, for implementing. It's not to catch the drivers doing stuff, not to watch over them, not to be their big brother. It's really for their safety. And by going in, communicating early, having stats showing that these systems do in decrease crashes and your crash risk, ultimately you're keeping those drivers safe. Uh, so that, that's my first suggestion. But the second suggestion is, and one thing that we found to be very successful in, in helping drivers get on board with this technology is to show them the benefits that these devices can do. And this comes down to driver exonerations. Um, I was doing some consulting work um, a couple months ago and, and the fleet vehicle got into a crash. The crash was not the fleet's fault. And it was the other vehicle's fault. However, the other vehicle driver um, filed a lawsuit against the fleet. The fleet, of course, had their, their onboard video was able to turn it over to the police, turn it over to their lawyers, and because they had that evidence, they never heard from that other vehicle driver's attorney ever again. The suit just went away, uh, in this case, likely saving that fleet um, at close to a million dollars in, in litigation and uh, liability. So once drivers know and can get experience and hear firsthand from other individuals that this technology can potentially save their job, could potentially save them from having to go to court um, and, and protect them from frivolous lawsuits. Uh, it really helps um, get drivers on board. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's basically just 
communicating with them, getting them to understand all of these reasons. Uh, they might even want to watch this webinar itself. Uh, but yeah, those are good tips. Thank you. All right, so, so the other behavior that, that we see a lot of, and to be quite honest, is only getting worse, is driver distraction. Uh, a lot of people, when we talk about driver distraction, only think about cell phones. Well, there's actually a lot more uh, to driver distraction beyond cell phones. There, there's three main types of distraction. There's manual distraction, and this is when we take our, our hands off the wheel. Uh, there's visual distraction. This is when we take our eyes off the road. And then there, there's cognitive distraction as well, and this is when we take our mind off the driving tasks. And we've done research on, on all of these types of behaviors. Um, the first type is, is really all related to cell phone. And what you can see here, we've broken the cell phone, cell phone tasks into individual um, behaviors. So dialing, um, reaching for the phone, texting, talking. Um, we've also looked at that hands-free device. And really, over all of our research over the past, really, uh, um, 15 years since cell phones just started to get into the car, is that the biggest risk with cell phones are any tasks that take the driver's eyes off the roadway. And this makes, this makes a lot of sense, right? If we're not looking forward, we have no chance of recognizing a risky situation. We have no chance of seeing a vehicle in front of us slowing down unexpectedly. But if our eyes are on the road, then we at least have a chance to react and respond to that, to that um, event. So you can see here the, the behaviors with the highest odds ratio, such as dialing, we use our eyes to dial, or texting, or reaching, or reading. All these things require our eyes to be off the roadway, and you see that they have the highest odds ratio. Um, a couple of these behaviors we see more often than others. So texting, we see about 2% of all of our driving data, we see people texting. Um, if we group all of the phone interactions together, we see about 6% of the time. So this is not just 6% of all crashes, this is 6% of, of all driving. Every time a, a driver is behind that wheel with the ignition on, we see about 6% uh, of phone interaction. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is over all of our studies, whether that's light vehicles and, and with people driving their personal vehicles or in um, occupational settings, is that hands-free phones, you can see in this slide, an odds ratio below one. That's actually showing that hands-free um, is not increasing crash risk, it's actually decreasing crash risk. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons we, we think that this is, and I think it's driven by um, the occupational drivers. Uh, these drivers are being more selective when they use the phone, and they're also adjusting their behavior. So when these occupational drivers are driving um, and they use their hands-free phone, they're actually giving a greater following distance. So they're, they're falling back behind that lead vehicle at a greater distance, giving them more of a cushion and, and more time to react if something did happen. Uh, the other reason I think that we're seeing a, a decrease with hands-free phones is for drivers who are driving long hours and in overnight hours. In these cases, usually there's not much traffic on the road, and drivers can become tired pretty, pretty easily, pretty quickly, especially if it's between the hours of, of midnight and 6 a.m. And what we found is that drivers during this time can use a phone almost as a countermeasure to that fatigue. So they can call a coworker or call a family member as a way to keep themselves alert. Uh, so, that, so that's just some of our, our, our thoughts on, on maybe why the hands-free part uh, may actually be decreasing risk in the studies that we've done. Um, so here's a couple of video examples to show kind of what distraction looks like. In this first one, as I mentioned, there, there's many distractions not associated with cell phones. So in this one, the guy's actually distracted by something outside his vehicle. Uh, so he's going down the road, you'll notice he looks out his left uh, window right here. So that vehicle in front of him decides to uh, come back into his lane. Unexpectedly, the driver, you know, almost hit him because he wasn't looking out his forward windshield. Uh, fortunately, he saw him at the last second and was able to swerve. Uh, but that was, that was very bad, um, very close to, to being a crash. 
Uh, and here's one um, of an internal intersection. This is a cell phone related crash. I don't know if the, the driver's actually on his cell phone. He puts it down and he right. Uh, I'll go play this one again. Uh, at the last second after he hangs up the phone, he looks down. Looks down at his phone and drives off the road. So right there, he looked, off, looked at his phone, went off the road, and wasn't able to correct in time and flipped his vehicle. Uh, but there's also a lot of cognitive risk. I'm sure we've all been in the situation where we've been driving, um, and then all of a sudden we realize that we've missed our exit or we can't remember the last couple minutes of our drive. These are all examples of, of cognitive distraction, and it's really just um, the most common part is daydreaming. Um, and it's when we're distracted by our thoughts or emotions. Um, it could also be us being distracted by um, a passenger in the vehicle that we're talking to, or maybe a phone conversation. Um, so some of the things that, that we find that does cause cognitive distraction are being in an argument. That could be, you know, you're in an argument with a passenger or you're in an argument on the phone, or even maybe you had an argument five minutes ago and you're still thinking about it. Um, being under pressure, whether that's family pressure or, or work-related pressure, uh, family concerns, um, being tired, driving in a monotonous um, driving condition, all these things can, can impact how alert you are and how much you're paying attention uh, to, the, to the driving task. Uh, so we've done research also on, on cognitive crash risk. And what we've found that when we break out the cognitive crashes or the cognitive behaviors into individual things, we don't see any increase in crash risk. Um, but when we group them all together, we do see a small increase in crash risk. Uh, in general, we, we found that, that cognitive um, distraction increases crash risk by 1.25. So it, it's, it's little, but it, it does show that we do see it increase. Um, I think the bigger thing is that we see cognitive distraction 20% of all the time, all the video that we have. So, that, so that's, that's a lot. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that uh, the intense emotion. So this is when you could be very angry um, or, or very sad or even very happy. Um, usually in those, those cases, we see people being um, not fully engaged in a driving task, and we see that it increases crash risk by almost 10, uh, 10 times. Um, and, and really the best examples we see of intense emotion are when somebody's crying and driving or maybe are very angry and making obscene gestures to other drivers. Uh, here's one example of, of a driver being tired. So we showed the one earlier of the driver falling asleep. Here's another one. Um, in this case, the driver actually doesn't close his eyes, but this is a, a very common example of, of somebody being drowsy. Uh, you'll notice the eyes never shut, uh, but he looks almost like he's dreaming, um, daydreaming. He starts to go off the road right, uh, uh, right here. You know, corrects it at the last second, but his eyes were looking straight ahead. He was swerving. Um, so something was going on. Uh, most likely he was tired. <clears throat> so we know that there's all these risk behaviors. Um, so how does our current situation with COVID-19 potentially increase or decrease or impact the occurrence of these risky driver, uh, driving behaviors? So uh, it, just some questions to ask yourself. Do you think that, that drivers now are going to be more or less likely to experience intense emotions? Um, are they going to be more or less likely to be cognitively distracted, use a cell phone, be tired? Uh, be in a rush, um, be engaged in, in aggressive driving. Now, we don't have all the answers to these questions, but we do know that when people are, are under pressure and under strain, whether that's, that's work-related strain, emotional strain, or family-related stress, um, those drivers are going to be at increased crash risk. Uh, we also think that 
that uh, drivers may be more likely to, to use their cell phone, um, whether that's talking to employers, figuring out uh, what their next um, dispatch location is, whether where their next work site is, uh, or maybe calling their friends and family to, to make sure everyone's still doing okay. Um, we also know that when people are, are stressed and, and under a lot of um, um, cognitive, cognitive stress, they're going to be more likely to not get good rest at night. So regardless of what type of fleet operation you have, whether you're in construction or sales or, or transportation, um, doesn't matter when you're driving, but if you're not getting enough sleep and you're not getting good quality sleep, that's gonna impact uh, how easily you can become fatigued while you are driving. So we do know that when people are under stress, they're less likely to get that good sleep at night. So this means it's, it's very possible that, that drivers may be more fatigued now with, with uh, COVID-19 going on. Um, some signs of fatigue, I, I do think this is, this is important. Um, give your drivers some education on, on what's going on in terms of fatigue so that they can identify if they are getting tired uh, because they didn't get good sleep. Of course, rubbing the face and eyes, uh, yawning, nodding the head. These are all pretty common. Um, most everyone knows that, you know, if, if I'm yawning, I'm tired, or if my head starts drooping, I'm definitely tired. Um, other things that, that people may not necessarily uh, know is that uh, just moving rest, restlessly in the seat is, is a behavior we often see people do when they're getting tired. Um, having tunnel vision, basically just looking straight ahead, not looking anywhere else is a sign of being tired. Uh, of course, drifting between lanes, tailgating, or missing stein, all signs of being tired. Um, jerking a vehicle back into the lane because you were nodding off. Um, and then, of course, drifting off the road. So I recommend that, that you can help provide some education uh, to your drivers that if they do notice things like this, it's important to, to take a break, pull over for two minutes, get outside of your vehicle, get some fresh air. Um, all these things help decrease fatigue pretty quickly. Um, they don't last very long, but it does provide a brief countermeasure so that your driver can get to where they're going safely. Um, so when you are tackling driver safety during COVID-19, there's really three key components to doing that. And they're the three E's, pretty easy to remember, education, engineering, and enforcement. Uh, so the first one, education. Really, it, all driver safety programs have to include some part of driver education. And, and it's really critical. Um, and, and the foundation of driver education in terms of safety is, is defensive driving. Uh, we do know that, that most crashes involving fleet vehicles are caused by another vehicle. It's not caused by your driver. Most of the time, you're, somebody's hitting your vehicle. Um, so defensive driving is really important. Um, and it should occur before any other types of safety intervention that you have going on. Um, what's important now is that there's a lot of online defensive driving things out there. A lot, some of it's free, some of it are, are paid programs, but there's a lot of choices out there. Um, and it's important to do refresher trainings. A lot of fleets will train their drivers once at hire, um, but after a year, two years, three years, 10 years, those drivers can still get valuable information from watching um, or participating in driver education programs. Um, it never hurts to hear information again. The more times we hear safety information, the more likely we're going to do it. And it can come in all sorts of forms. It can come in flyers, posters, newsletters, emails, over a dispatching device. Uh, really, the more ways we can get safety messages out to our drivers, the more likely that they're going to listen and, and use that information. Um, but education alone isn't enough. Uh, it really involves engineering and, and enforcement as well. And the good thing about technology and the engineering, which is the engineering component, is that allows you to, to do the enforcement aspect of it as well. Um, just for example, this is why enforcement's needed. Uh, we all know there's speed limits on the road. Many of your fleets have policies regarding speed limits. But just because we have those policies, just because we have those speed limits, doesn't mean people follow those speed limits, right? Um, what happens if there's a policeman sitting in the middle of the road? Everyone slams on the brakes all of a sudden, right? So 
without that enforcement um, at random places or policies guiding enforcement, drivers are going to be less likely to, to follow the education. And this is where the technology really comes in. With continuous data um, available through telematics or video-based uh, monitoring systems, it really gives fleets valuable information to understand if their drivers are being safe, if they are following those policies. Um, and it's important because it also helps you identify what risky things drivers may be doing. And it can help you target education on those specific behaviors. Um, and it can help you identify drivers that may need additional corrective action, whether that's additional training or additional warnings, or even possibly termination if, if nothing um, has worked up to this point. So how can you, in, in this time of COVID-19 when we're dealing with all this stuff, how can you keep driver safety um, at the top of your mind? Uh, well, it really all starts with leadership, but you also have to have policies. Uh, you have to have the health education. You have to have the, the driver safety education. Use the technologies you have available to you. Um, coach the drivers and also check in occasionally. So we're going to go through each of these um, right now. So first, it, it all starts with the leadership. What we know is that in a fleet, if the leaders aren't on board and fully supporting the safety program, uh, the safety program is doomed to fail. It might work for a couple of months, but ultimately, if you want continuous success, it all comes down to having that leadership um, support. And it needs to be demonstrated so that the drivers, so that the frontline employees, so that the office workers all see the leadership being engaged and supportive of, of the safety programs. Um, leadership needs to be proactive and they need to be actionable. They need to avoid lip service. So instead of just say, saying wearing your seatbelt is important, they need to actually do it themselves. They need to always buckle up so that anytime they're pulling into your parking lot, uh, drivers will see you're wearing your seatbelt too. What you don't want to do is, is tell your drivers that some a behavior is important, such as wearing your seatbelt, and then show up and, and don't follow your own guidelines. That's just going to sabotage your safety program. Um, another thing that, that we see in our research is to always seek the feedback from the people those programs or policies are targeting. So if you have a safety program or safety policy targeting drivers, talk to those drivers, see if that policy is impacting them, see if that policy is effective, see if that policy is out of date and needs to be updated. Um, provide opportunities for questions. A lot of times drivers will have many questions, especially during COVID-19. They'll want to know what your policies are for, for keeping them healthy and keeping them safe. So provide those opportunities for questions. Talk to the drivers. Help ease their, their um, uncertainty. And this is going to help ease their stress and help keep them safe on the road. Um, last thing here is that make sure you're not asking drivers to do things that go against your policies. One example that we see all the time is that fleets will have complete ban on all cell phone communication. But what happens is that safety manager will need to call those drivers and they do it. Well, that's, that's violating your own policy. If you're going to allow your safety managers to call your drivers, make sure you have a policy that backs it up. So what we recommend to those fleets is have the, uh, the, the hands-free policy if you're going to call your drivers and give your drivers a hands-free device or Bluetooth device so that they can um, be in line and follow your policies without violating it, but still be in communication. Um, policies, I've talked about it uh, a number of times. Um, during COVID-19, a lot of people are relaxing policies. What you don't want to do is just throw all your policies out the window. Be very hesitant to relax your driver safety policy. You don't want to um, put your drivers at greater risk just because uh, of what's going on now. Um, so examine if your previous policies and procedures need to be revised. Are they still relevant? Um, have your standard operating procedures changed during COVID-19? How could you draft or create policies to support those changes? 
um, what other procedures are needed to ensure your drivers are, are staying healthy, staying safe. Do you need new policies on, on social distancing? Uh, do you need sanitation policies for drivers to uh, wipe um, services that, that are touched frequently? Um, and then also have additional checks um, to make sure that, that there is a lot of communication going on between drivers and, and management. Um, so after you, you've got the leadership, leadership support, that's first, uh, you've got the policies. Next thing is to ensure we have that proper health education. Um, there's a lot of good guidelines out there, whether that's from the feds, whether that's from your state, whether that's from the CDC, whether that's from your own fleet. There's a lot of, of recommendations out there. Just make sure they get into your driver's hands and make sure your drivers don't have any questions about them and are following those guidelines. It's really not only for their own health and safety, but it's for everyone at your fleet and customers' uh, health. So um, provide the resources also so that they can um, follow through with that, uh, whether that's cleaning equipment, uh, other types of personal protective equipment, such as masks or gloves, um, and the time to go and make sure everything is clean. What we don't want to do is for everyone to be rushing around and the driver not feel like they have enough time to properly clean and take care of themselves. Just the understanding that, that some tasks may take a little bit longer now than they would have before COVID-19. After that, we need to make sure that the drivers have that, that safety education that I talked about a few minutes ago. Provide the regular ongoing driver training. Uh, this could include any type of seasonal things going on. It could include defensive driving. Uh, it could include tips for avoiding fatigue or inattention or distraction. Um, could be providing a lot of resources. There's a lot of free resources out on um, reducing anxiety or stress management. Um, and again, many of these things are online, which is, which is great. Drivers don't need to come in and take a classroom portion. Um, you can push out links to, to online videos or online brochures or information sheets. Uh, and then finally, the vehicle technology. You know, vehicle technology is seen at a rapid Pace. There's a lot of different types out there. So whatever type you're using, uh, make sure that you know what data you have relating to driver safety and, and utilize it. This could be telematics data, could be GPS data, video data, or data off any types of, of driver assistance systems, whether that's lane keeping systems on, on light vehicles, um, automatic cruise control, um, automatic braking. Many of these systems provide you with some sort of kinematic data that will help give you a KPI uh, that we talked about earlier as an indication of how your driver's performing and if they're staying safe. So what we do know is that the research shows that all of this data is really powerful and does help reduce uh, behaviors we know cause crashes such as speeding, uh, tailgating, hard braking, um, but the data also helps us with, with routing too, um, to be more efficient and to give uh, the, the um, locations we're going to a better idea of when we will arrive so that they can be prepared and so that they don't have unrealistic expectations on, on when we'll be there. Uh, driver coaching, so this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the, the safety education we talked about before, but driver coaching really goes beyond just providing um, online resources. It, it's much more individualized. So because we have all this data from our devices, whether that's uh, the telematics data or the video data, what we know is that the coaching is really what improves the, the safety performance of those drivers. And we've done a lot of research over the years to identify the best practices associated with coaching. So in other words, what does really good coaching look like that really makes drivers safer and reduce those risky things that they do? Um, some of them we have here. So meet regularly. This doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. It could be done virtually, um, or it could even just be check-ins, um, an email once a week or an email every day. 
um, or a phone call. Uh, just meet regularly and discuss safety, discuss if, if that driver had any issues, um, and discuss what the data shows. Um, also set realistic goals. This doesn't mean giving the driver some uh, crazy goal that they may or may not be able to achieve. Uh, being, setting small incremental goals for improvement has been shown to be much more successful at driving behavior change. Uh, the other thing for, for driver coaching is to use that data to look for patterns. Are certain safe behaviors increasing or are they decreasing? Or the same thing for, for unsafe behaviors. Are certain unsafe behaviors such as speeding, um, the frequency of speeding increasing? And use that data to give positive reinforcement for the things that driver is doing good. Uh, this could just be a congratulations or acknowledgement during your your one on one virtual or or uh, face to face meeting, or it even could be acknowledging in front of other drivers, saying, you know, John over here, he's really improved. He's reduced his his hard brakes by fifty percent, or he hasn't had a single speeding violation in over a month. These types of things are shown to to be um, highly recognized as being uh, effective at improving safety. So it doesn't always have to be some sort of monetary um, recognition or reinforcement. Simple acknowledgement uh, that a driver is doing good is often a, a really good motivator. Um, we talked about this a little bit before too. Target behaviors, not the person. So focus on the, the behaviors that that individual is doing. Uh, focus on the hard brakes, the speeding, uh, the feedback they're giving, uh, how often or how engaged they are in the safety programs. Um, if they are taking their defensive driving courses in a timely manner, things like that. Um, and be receptive to feedback. If drivers come to you and, and say something's not working or they have a problem about one of your safety programs, uh, take that to heart and, and look into it. Follow up with it in a timely manner and get back to the driver. Some of the feedback uh, might help you improve your safety program. Some of it might not. but it's important to, to always follow through with it because what you don't want to do is not follow through with the feedback because then that driver is not going to come to you when there is a valid safety concern um, that you do need to address. So follow through uh, and, and get back to that driver to let them know that, that you know you looked into it and something may or may not uh, um, be changed associated with that. Um, and then remind drivers why safety is important. This is, I think, important when we talk about the video um, uh, technology that uh, we mentioned before. A lot of drivers are hesitant to, to go with the video, but it all comes down really to safety. And, and we need to remind drivers and, and show drivers that we support them and keeping them safe, helping them come home to their families or their friends. Um, and come back to work every day because we, we value uh, their employment and what they do for the company and for the fleet. Uh, so we need to remind drivers frequently, you know, why we're doing what we're doing and why safety is important. Um, and then lastly, our, our safety check-in. So there's a couple ways this goes. One, we need to check to sure our programs are actually working. So this gets at looking at those outcome uh, measures that we have, how many crashes we're doing. How many injuries? What are our, our costs for crashes? Are they improving or are they, or are they not improving? Um, so that's one type of check-in. The other type of check-in is, is just with your employees. You know, especially now with, with COVID going on, you know, have frequent check-ins, whether that's every couple of days, every day at the end of the shift, you know, ask how their health is or, or how their, their family is or their friends are. Um, ask if there, there's anything that you as a fleet or as an employer can do to help. Uh, do they need anything? Are, th are they getting enough rest? Um, and also, you know, regularly review how your programs are working in. Has COVID changed or made uh, the need to change any of your policies or programs? Are there new behaviors that are going on because of COVID-19? Um, and are, are risks identified through the feedback? So are drivers giving you feedback um, to help you identify any additional risks? Uh, so kind of just to summarize and wrap it up, you know, COVID-19 has changed everything in terms of, of our fleet operations. And it has the potential to have serious consequences on, on what our drivers are doing behind the wheel, not just on whether they're getting sick or not, but it, 
we know that it, it has potential to, to make them more tired, um, to make them more aggressive, uh, to make them more distracted. So we don't, can't let our, our driving safety fall off. We need to check in, we need to make sure our drivers are healthy, but they're also doing those things that keep them safe while they're behind the wheel. To support them, provide the resources, provide the education, uh, use the technology and, and coach the drivers so that uh, they can be as safe as they always have been. Great, thank you, Matt, so much. Um, now we'd like to just open it up to any questions uh, that you all may have. So if you have a question, again, go ahead and send it over uh, through the Q&A uh, box there and we'd be happy to answer those questions. Yeah, hey, Matt, I, I have a question on um, kind of thinking back to the, the data side of things and how all of this gets operationalized into the, the fleet um, as they're they're gauging and tracking all of these these metrics and behaviors, is there any type of like best in class safety benchmark that they should be shooting for, um, or is it more just like about every single detail, almost more of a checklist style, uh, making sure everything is done, or is there like a roll up number they should shoot for? Yeah, so there are definitely benchmarks, and, and I think the important thing to consider is that whatever industry or whatever type of fleet operation you have, that benchmark is gonna be different. So uh, a fleet in construction is gonna be very different than a long haul tractor trailer fleet. Or a fleet that has a, a bunch of sales individuals going all across the country may be very different than um, a, a, a local delivery company. Um, so it's important to, to consider that. The other thing, and I think the best way to get uh, some benchmark data is from the technology provider that, that you're trying to uh, compare your data from. Um, so, for example, I know that a lot of fleets can help gauge and provide benchmarking data from all their customers to help you understand, you know, where you are in your fleet compared to, to all the other customers. And then on top of that, I think that uh, a number of national organizations or associations have really good information on benchmarking uh, in terms of driving. So I know the National Safety Council has pretty good information on, on benchmarking for various industries. And then the, uh, the Network for Employers of Traffic Safety, or NETS, they do a benchmark service or survey every year for their members. So I'd recommend three things. You know, talk to your technology provider, uh, talk to peer companies that, that you have good relationships with, and also look to see if um, you are already a member of these kind of national or international organizations, um, and if not, if you want to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, feel free to shoot it over. Uh, while you're you're typing out those questions, uh, I, I feel the need here to do a, a shameless plug of Azuga because there's so many things that we're talking about here that uh, we're able to integrate in through our platform and, and help the teams on the call uh, operationalize this to their drivers um, through that technology that you were just mentioning. So I see some of, some of the attendees are customers already. Um, so hopefully you're getting what you need out of it. Reach out to us if you have any questions. If you're not a customer, which I see a few of you on here too, um, you know, reach out to us. Let's have a conversation about how we can help you and, and keep your drivers safe. Um, you know, there's a lot we can do, especially in terms of the data and scoring the, the safety and, and making sure that, um, you know, this isn't the big brother environment. It truly is. How do we, how do we protect our drivers? How do we protect the, the businesses that they're driving for uh, and, and streamline a lot of these things that when they're out of sight, out of mind, problems happen. So we want to bring that to the forefront and kind of give you the technology side of this playbook. Um, so that you can really get this into your business and, and help you out. Um, with that too, a lot of this is going to be, or already is summarized into kind of an ebook, white paper style uh, playbook. Um, so we'll be emailing that to all of the attendees as kind of a thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, we'll also be sending you the, the recording. Um, but 
Yeah, we're here for you if you need us. We know it's difficult times for everybody, uh, and there's kind of there's all driver safety is always important, but it really feels like right now uh, this is a major priority for for all businesses that have drivers, especially larger fleets. Um, so. Barbara, Matt, do you have any closing thoughts or anything uh, before we, we close this out? Yeah, I think just to add to that, um, just would like to thank everybody for joining us today and thank Matt for leading today's session. Uh, we hope it was a great um, use of your time. As Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned, if you have any questions, uh, you know, please contact your Azuga representative if you're already a customer of ours. And if you'd like to get more information, you can email us at info at azuga.com. And then lastly, you are going to be taken to a uh, one minute survey. So we would appreciate if you could share your feedback on today's session. And more importantly, just let us know if there are any other topics that you'd like us to, uh, to cover in upcoming webinars. Hey, before we close out, um, we do have one, one last question here on, um, have you had many legal entities use your info? Um, and, and Jeff, we might need to expand on that by what you mean by legal entities. Um, if it's uh, if it's you know, in lawsuits and things like that, uh, it's actually very common. Um, but maybe explain a little further on what you mean by legal entities, the so law firms. Yeah. Um, I know from our side on the Azuga side, we, we definitely turn over a lot of this data and our customers turn over like the videos specifically. I think Matt was mentioning earlier, um, one of those specific videos uh, actually protected the company from the lawsuit. Uh, so, so yeah, very common that these are used in litigation. Matt, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's really common, um, not just for driver exonerations. We, a lot of fleets will use the data to quickly settle suits. So if you're a driver and you have video data showing that your driver was the cause of the crash, instead of fighting that for months or years, the fleet will settle it. And because they settle it quickly, they settle it for a lot less than, than what they would have before. Um, we also see uh, uh, legal entities using telematics data showing um, or proving that their drivers are, do not have habits of uh, excessive speeding or excessive heartbreaking, things like that. Um, but so we see it, we see it used very often. Thanks for that question, a good question. Um, so we're coming to the end of the time here, kind of perfect timing. Uh, like Barbara said, Matt, we really appreciate you going through all, all the data and the examples and the feedback. I think this was really good, really powerful stuff. I think we have quite a few takeaways. Um, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to give to the audience? Yeah, everyone just, just stay safe and, and keep going away, but don't, uh, don't forget about your driver's safety and, and make sure that they're doing everything that they can to stay safe on the road. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, as Matt says, stay safe, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. And uh, as always, if we can help you, reach out to us and uh, happy to help. Thanks a lot and have a good day.